van Handel again from Princeton, giving the second lecture in his course uh, on the discrete cube. All right. Um, thank you, Nike. So um, basically, uh, I still owe you something from the last lecture. So um, let's see. I just copied some of the things that I had in the last lecture. Um, <clears throat> so remember that last time we uh, proved the Poincaré inequality. And the Poincaré inequality just says that the variance of any function on the discrete cube is bounded by the expectation of the square of its discrete gradient. Um, and the beauty of this equation, which I emphasize again, is that the constant, okay, the constant being one is not so important, but the constant doesn't depend on dimension, right? Which means this is, this is really a high dimensional phenomenon. Any, any function in arbitrary dimension that is sufficiently smooth will have fluctuations of the same order. The fluctuations do not grow with dimension. And this is really why such inequalities are, are important in, in many different areas. Um, so how did we do this? In order to prove it, we introduced this object that's called the semigroup, PT of F. So to any function F on the discrete cubes, it associates a function PT of F. And uh, what this what this semigroup does is it interpolates between the function itself and its expectation, right? So at t is zero, it gives the function. And at t is infinity, it gives the expectation. And this is the way that we control the variance. The variance is the expectation of f squared minus the expectation of f squared. So by interpolating between these things, we were able to bound the difference. So I, I explained this last time. So exactly how we came to this doesn't matter for this lecture. Um, at the end of the day, here we have a very explicit description of what this PT is, right? PT f of epsilon, the function PT f of epsilon is just the expectation of the function f of epsilon times xi. And xi are these biased uh, Bernoulli variables, right? They take the values plus or minus one with probability one plus or minus e to the minus t over two. And once you have that, we can take that as a definition if you want. Then we just started computing and I needed a list of, um, of properties, which I have reproduced here in this lemma. And I promised you that I would prove them. So let's do it. Um, so the first property is that if I take the expectation of PTF, that's just the expectation of if, right? So the semigroup doesn't change the expectation. Well, let's just compute it. What's the expectation of PT of if? Well, if you look at this formula, right? And you see in the formula for PTF, epsilon was fixed and C was random. So now if we take the expectation, we're just taking the expectation with respect to epsilon, right? So this is just the expectation over C and epsilon of the function of epsilon C at t. Right? So here epsilon are iid random bits, prob probability plus or minus one being one half, and ct is this biased version of it. Right? But now if we average over epsilon, you see I can take the expectation with respect to epsilon first. right? So even though these CTs, think of the CTs being fixed. These are just a bunch of signs. right? If I have Bernoulli's with probability one half of being plus or minus one, if I multiply this by a sign, by any sign, it's still going to be plus or minus one with probability one half, right? So as soon as I take the expectation with respect to epsilon, the C completely disappears from the story, right? So this is just equal to the expectation of F of epsilon, which is the expectation of F, of F in my notation. So this is a very, uh, it's a trick that we will use later very um, crucially. Um, if you take the expectation with respect to unbiased Bernoulli's, it doesn't matter what you multiply them by. You can multiply them by any random variables of any sign, as long as they're independent of the epsilon, they're not going to change the distribution. So it's a simple observation, but here you have it. Now, um, the second uh, point, we had to compute how the rate of change of the semigroup over time, right? This was the key point in the computation of the, of the Poincaré inequality. So let's just compute what PTF is, okay? So what is PTF of epsilon? Well, I wrote up here in fact, where you see fact, I have an expression. It's the expectation with respect to some random variable. So I can just write out the formula for what that expectation is, because I told you what are the probabilities of these random variables, right? So this is the sum over all vectors C in minus one plus one to the N. And now I can just write out the probability that C i is equal to C one is equal to little C one, C two of T is equal to C of T, C two, et cetera, right? So this is the product j is one to n of one plus c j e to the minus t over two, right? So this is the problem. One of these terms, the j term is just the probability that c j of t is equal to the sine c j, right? Times the function of epsilon times c. And so I've just write, written out the explicit distribution of this uh, of these random variables. Um, and now you notice we can play the same game as in part zero, right? Because um, here I sum over all strings xi of plus or minus one to the n, right? So if I multiply them by any signs, I can just sum them in a different order, right? So if I, I can 
I can multiply here xi by any random science epsilon. And it doesn't change because I'm just summing over all possible strings of lengths n. Right? So I can equivalently write this as the sum of xi in plus or minus one to the n of the product j is one to n, but I can multiply every xij by epsilon j. It doesn't matter because I'm summing over all possibilities of xij anyway, right? It's just a change of variables. So I can write this as one plus epsilon j xij e to the minus t over two. Uh, and now we just get f of xi. I, I haven't changed anything. I've done this change of variables. Well, now you can just compute. So what happens if I take ddt of ptf epsilon? Right, so t only appears inside this product, so it's a product of n terms, so I have to do the product rule, right? So it's um, sum i is 1 to n, and now in the ith term, I took the derivative of the ith object over here, right? So I get epsilon i ci e to the minus t over 2, and I should get a minus because I differentiate the e to the minus t, and then the remaining terms are, the j's are not equal to i, 1 plus epsilon j cj e to the minus t over 2, times f of c, right? So I just applied the product rule. But now if you look at each term in the sum, that's exactly what I would get if I took the epsilon i, right? If I flipped the, the sign of the epsilon i and I subtracted it from this object over here, right? In the i term, the one plus would drop out and I'd get exactly the same term, right? So this is nothing else than minus some i is one to n of di of ptf of epsilon. Right. You just see it from the formula, right? When I took DDT, then in the ith term, the one plus disappeared because it was constant. I just got minus e to the minus t. But that's the same as saying, okay, what happens if I flip the ith bit, the ith epsilon? Well, then I just change the, the term of the e to the minus t, right? The, the one also drops out and I get exactly the same. formula. So this is, again, just a computation. You can just, once you have a formula, you can just compute all these things by hand. Right, and the Laplacian, this that I denote by delta, is minus the sum of di, right? That's the definition of the Laplacian. Good. Now, in part two, I just did some linear algebra. Ramon, you see, you, yes, Ramon, please. Uh, maybe uh, one question is the missing sum on psi. Oh, that's very possible. Absolutely. Um, let me stick it in. Thank you very much. You can, of course, not just stop summing. There we go. And, okay. And the second, and the second question, question is more philosophical. Okay. I mean, so the expression there that looks a little bit like Fourier, Fourier oh, expression. So somebody is asking if it's obvious or dumb, but is that rewriting after a change of variables some sort of Fourier expansion, since you promised not to do Fourier expansion, I guess. So, you know, the Laplacian has the Fourier, the, the, the Walsh functions as its eigenfunction. So everything I write out, I mean, almost by definition can be written in terms of Fourier expansion. But, um, uh, you know, another way to say it is that if you look at this formula I have for PTF, you see, this is just a convolution. If you write this in Fourier language, I've just written here the convolution of F with this function over here, this heat kernel over here. So it's not surprising that if I have a convolution on the discrete cube and I Fourier transform it, it just turns into a product, right? That's the explanation why um, this PT will become diagonal on the Fourier basis. So I want to emphasize that nothing I have done in this first lecture and by extension here really benefits from having the perspective of these random variables that I introduced. Absolutely nothing. In this lemma that I wrote over here, basically everything can be proved in, 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 in two lines using Fourier expansion. If I had started with Fourier expansion, many of these things would be obvious, but I wouldn't even have had to do them because the Poincaré inequality is obvious from the Fourier perspective itself. Um, you're not going to see the payoff of thinking about this in this way until, um, until we prove something new. Okay, so right now, um, even though I wrote just to set up the language and notation I'm going to use in all the lectures, I wrote everything in terms of these random variables CT, and I'm being very pedantic about it, right? But right now you cannot see what the payoff of this is. Uh, you will see what the payoff of this is when we prove new things. And, and in those new things, we don't know how to, or at least I don't know how to express that in Fourier language, okay? So, but it is true, those of you who, you, you who know Fourier expansions, not only can, but should feel that I'm doing a lot of very pedantic things that, that could have been done much easier.
But going back to the drawing board is, a, is, is, is good because it will lead us to think about the problems in a different way, okay? Not that, I, not that even this is anything new, what I'm writing here, but, but, uh, but you will see this maybe not in this lecture, but at the very beginning of the next lecture, we will see why, um, why this paid off. Okay, I hope this answered the question. Um, let's talk about part two. Part two should be uh, more or less obvious from part one. Um, so, except for what does the notation mean, uh, you know, these are functions on a discrete cube. The discrete cube is a finite set, right? So you should just think of these functions as big vectors, two to the n dimensional vectors. And then this object called PTF, which is just a linear function of f, you can just think of it as a big matrix, right? And similarly, the Laplacian, you can just think of it as a matrix. So all of these formulas, when I just, I can view them as matrix vector formulas, right? So when I write DDT PTF equals Laplacian PTF, if you think of PT as a matrix and F of a vector, right? You can just drop F of both sides. You have DDT PT is Laplacian PT. Obviously the solution of that equation is PT is E to the T times Laplace, right? And from this, you can see immediately, for example, that all of the derivatives commute with PT and the derivatives commute with the Laplacian because the Laplacian is just the sum of derivatives and the com derivatives commute with each other. Okay, so it's just a shorthand way of, 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 of seeing a lot of simple formulas that, that we could also check by hand if you want. Let's, uh, let's do part three. So this is again, it, this is integration by parts, but integration by parts on the discrete cube is not exactly rocket science, right? So what is the expectation of F times the Laplacian of G, right? By definition of the Laplacian, this is minus the sum of expectation of F times DIG. Right. And now um, you should remember that, that uh, so maybe let me put in the epsilons. Um, you should remember that uh, one of the very first things that I remarked about these discrete derivatives is that di is anti-symmetric. Um, di is anti-symmetric in epsilon i. If I flip the sign of epsilon i, then the i derivative will flip sign, okay? This is because I can write di f of epsilon as epsilon i times partial i f of epsilon, where partial i is this derivative where I just set the i bit to mi one minus where I set the i bit to minus one and I divide by two, right? So this partial i doesn't depend on epsilon i. So you see that di is just linear in epsilon i and therefore if I flip the sign of epsilon i, I just flip the sign of di. Right? So what does this mean? This means that the expectation of f epsilon dig of epsilon, if I flip the sign of the ith bit, of course, nothing changes because the, I take the expectation, right? The ith bit is plus or minus one with probably one half. So if I flip the sign of the ith bit, the expectation remains the same, right? But if I flip the sign of the ith bit, right, then the first term will become, have the sign of the ith bit flipped. But by anti-symmetry, dig of epsilon will just become minus dig of epsilon, right? So I just get plus dig of epsilon. Right? So I have here two formulas for Laplacian, the first one and the second one. This one has a minus, the second one doesn't have a minus, right? And the second one only has the ith bit flipped in if, right? But if I average these two formulas, which are the same, then I get exactly what I claimed I get, right? Because f of epsilon minus f where I flip the i bit divided by two, that's exactly the definition of the discrete derivative, right? So I, all I've done here in some sense is integrated by both, okay? So this goes a bit quickly, but uh, you know, uh, you can check it for yourself. Um, and the fourth one is maybe the most interesting one. So let's again use this property. So let's compute what is DIPTF of epsilon. Well, by part two, I can exchange di and pt. So I can write this as pt di f of epsilon, right? Because the, the semi-group and the derivative commute. And now let's write out probabilistically what this means, right? So this is the expectation xi of what? Of di f of epsilon xi t, right? This is using the representation for the semi -group. And now let's use this property. So let's write this in terms of this one-sided derivative times epsilon i, right? But here, the thing is not a function of epsilon. It's a function of epsilon ct, right? So I can write this as epsilon i. I don't take the expectation with respect to epsilon times the expectation of ct times partial i 
f of epsilon ct. So here I'm using the anti-symmetry, if you want, of the discrete derivative. But you see this partial i, by definition, doesn't depend on ct. Uh, Ravan, right? sorry to interrupt yes. you. I think uh, maybe, no, someone commented it, the writing is a bit small, so people are having trouble reading it, I think. Oh, it's too small? Yeah, I'm, I'm reaching the end of the page, and I'm uh, um, uh, getting smaller and smaller. Unfortunately, I have no idea how to zoom in this object uh, that I have here, this, this iPad. Um, I think also we cannot see the bottom bottom of your screen. So before people- Is this okay? Watching, yeah, that's better. But um, should I rewrite it bigger? I think scrolling up helped actually. Okay, so let's, uh, let's continue then as it is. Um, so where are we at? We have the expectation of CT times partial IF epsilon CT, but this thing doesn't depend on the ith coordinate, right? So I can just, these two, these, I can just take the expectation with respect to C, sorry, this should be C i of t, of course. I can just take the expectation of X C i of t, and that's e to the minus t, right? So this is epsilon i e to the minus t times the expectation of this partial i, but that's just p t of this partial i of f. This is an identity. Now, if I square both sides, the epsilon will disappear. The e to the minus t will turn e to the minus 2t, which I had over here. And then I can just apply Jensen. pt of partial i f is less or equal than pt squared is less or equal pt of partial i f squared. And because partial i f only differs by a sign from dif, that's the expectation of dif squared. And I get exactly this. So again, there's nothing deep going on here. This is just a, you know, once you have this probabilistic representation, um, you can just do these computations manually and, uh, and you will see that um, all of these properties simply pop up. Okay. So um, this there's is probably, more, yes. There's one more question about just the definition of the Laplacian. I yes. Mean, uh, why, why, I mean, why do you have the minus sign? Ah. Um, this is a convention, even if when they're with the regular Laplacian, there is a, um, um, there are different conventions for what sign you put on them. Um, so uh, I, for example, think of the regular Laplacian as the sum of the second derivative squared, but an analyst would think about it with a minus. So this Laplacian is negative semi-definite. And you can see it here, right? This e to the t times Laplacian, this is the semi-group. This had better be a contraction, otherwise it could not be a probability. Uh, it, it could not be a probability, right? So this this Laplacian has to have non-positive eigenvalues, right? The way I defined it here. Of course, I could have removed the minus, but then I would have to put the minus everywhere else where the Laplacian appears. So this is just a convention. What do you call the convention? But I've chosen the same convention that you would use if you called the regular Laplacian in Rn the sum of the second derivatives of the function. Okay. So that's I'm using that convention for. But if you don't like it, you can remove the minus and then put a minus everywhere else where I wrote the Laplacian and it would still be correct. Okay, so this is uh, good. Are there other questions? You, you will find both conventions used, I think, equally in the literature. So it just depends on, on, on what type of person you're talking to. Okay, it is my aim, and you can tell me if I'm successful at the end, that this, what I just did, is the most boring part of the four talks. Okay, so... Um, you can, uh, you can tell me if I succeed. Okay. All right, let's move on to something else. Ah, no, I wanna make one more comment before I move on. Let's make a remark. So remember the Poincaré inequality says that the variance is bounded by the expectation of the discrete derivative square. Okay. Let's treat the world's stupidest example. Let's take a linear function. Right, just a linear combination of the signs, right, with some coefficients ai. Right? So what is the variance of this? The mean is zero, right, because I just took a linear combination of signs. So the variance is just the expectation of the squared. And of course, you know, you could just expand the square. The expectation of epsilon i squared is one. The expectation of epsilon i epsilon j is zero. So this is just the sum i is one to n of ai squared. But actually, d i of f, if I take, what happens if I take the, the ith derivative, right? So I take the function of epsilon minus the function where I flip the sign only of the ith bit and I divide by two. 
course, that's just AI, right? So this is equal to the expectation of the gradient of the function squared. So actually, you see this constant one is sharp. In the Poincaré inequality, linear functions, they achieve the equality case of the Poincaré inequality. So it's good to think about linear functions. I'm not just making this remark uh, um, for the heck of it. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to come back to this rule. Okay, so, um, um, but for now, just view this as one very, very simple example. All right, so now, um, now we're ready to go on and actually uh, do something new. And what I'm going to do is the rest of this lecture, I'm mostly going to um, ask the right questions. And the real punchline of these lectures will come at the very beginning of the next lecture. At least that's my plan. Okay, so um, let's ask some questions that are not completely classical. So the questions I'm going to ask about are about vector valued functions. So remember the Poincaré inequality is an equality for real valued functions, right? But what happens if I take a function from the discrete cube that takes values in some norm space, right? So it's some vector space and I'll put a norm on it. Okay. And then you could ask a very basic question, right? These types of inequalities like the one I've just shown you, do they make sense for vector valued functions, right? Are there vector valued analogs of the Poincaré inequality. And if you think about this question, I'm going to show you some examples a little bit later on, which will motivate maybe a little bit more why you should care about those things. Um, but um, if you're interested, for example, in, in functional analysis, this is a very natural question in its own right, right? Is there a vector valued analog of the Poincaré inequality? Um, and if you start thinking just about this question, the way I phrased it, um, it's not even clear what it means, right? You know, if, if we want to have a vector value inequality, we'd better write down something that even makes sense, right? So let's try to, um, let's try to imagine uh, what, what, what it could look like, right? So here is a first attempt. Okay. So let me remind you that what is the scalar Poincaré inequality? It says that the variance is bounded by um, the sum of the derivative squared, right? So let me just write the scalar inequality again. It says that the variance, well, you can write the variance as the expectation of f minus this expectation squared, right? Is bounded by sum i is one to n of the expectation of the derivative of the function squared, right? This, this, this is just a Poincaré inequality for scalar functions written out again. So now, of course, this inequality doesn't make any sense if f takes values in a vector space because you can't square a vector, right? Now, f of epsilon is a vector, right? You can't square a vector. But this space has a norm on it. And let me just, to, to distinguish it from the Euclidean norm, let me call it norm x, the norm in this vector space, right? Well, well, the most natural thing that you could do is that f is a vector, I could just turn each of these guys into a norm. And now the inequality makes perfect sense. Let me add in a constant just so you don't think that I'm too pedantic. Okay, so here I wrote inequality. I just wrote down the Poincaré inequality again for scalar functions, but every I saw an absolute value, I just turned into a norm. Now I have an inequality, which makes perfect sense for vector valued functions, right? And now you can ask yourself whether this inequality makes sense. Right? So let's see what the problem is. Right? Now, remember, I just did a very silly example in the linear, in, 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 the, in, the, in the scalar case, I plugged in the linear function, right? And then we saw that that was great because for linear functions, the Poincaré inequality was even equality. So let's try to do this now, right? Because in the vector valued case, because linear functions make sense in any vector space, right? So let's pick a linear function. Some i is one to n, epsilon i x i. Now the coefficients are not numbers, but the coefficients are just some vectors, right? So this is a linear, this function is linear in the epsilon, just a linear combination of some given vector. So let me give this inequality, let me call it star, right? So suppose we plug the linear function into star, what would it give? Well, on the left-hand side, we'd have that the expectation of the norm of this linear combination of vectors with random signs, right? And uh, on the right-hand side, we have some i is one to n, 
Remember, di of f is just xi. So we just get um, the norm of xi squared in this space. Right? So if this inequality star were true, then you should also have this inequality for a linear function in particular, which is a very special kind of function, right? You should have this statement that the expectation of the norm of a linear combination of vectors with random signs squared should be bounded by the sum of the squares of the norms of those vectors. Well, so what? Doesn't look so bad. But the point is that there is no reason for such inequalities to be true, right? So for example, this is true if X is a Hilbert space or a Euclidean norm. If you want to think about finite dimensional vectors with the Euclidean norm. Right, because for Euclidean norm, if X is a Hilbert space, the norm is just the sum of the squares of the individual elements, right? So then, of course, this inequality just follows from the scalar case immediately. But for example, what happens if X is L1, right? So this is another perfectly fine norm, the L1 norm. So let's check it. And let's take XI to be the coordinate vectors, right? So XI are going to be the vectors um, that have I that have a zero. Can you lift the screen a little bit? Yes. That have a one in the ith coordinate and a zero everywhere else. These are, these, these are just going to be the coordinate vectors, right? And so then the sum i is one to n of epsilon i x i is just going to be the vector of epsilon one through epsilon n, right? So it's a vector of random signs. So if I took the L1 norm of a vector of random signs, the sum of the absolute values, that's just n, right? So on the left-hand side, we have n squared because we have a square here on this norm, right? But each of the xi's, which is a vector which just has one one in it, the norm of that is just one. So on the right-hand side, we have a sum of n ones, which is n, right? So if x were the L1 norm, then on the left-hand side, we have n squared, and on the right-hand side, we have n. And then obviously this inequality cannot hold with a dimension-free constant. So, you see that even though in the scalar case there was one Poincaré inequality, it was very clear what it should be. In the vector case, you know, it's not at all clear that such a thing would be true. It depends on the properties of the of the norm x. Right? So in some sense, it seems that this is not the right question to ask um, because even in the linear case, we don't understand what is the right thing, right? In the linear case, the behavior of linear functions depends very strongly on what the norm is that you choose in the space, right? So if the behavior of linear functions even depends very strongly on what the norm is that you choose in linear space, how can you hope to understand nonlinear functions, right? I mean, this is, uh, it should depend on, you know, I mean, for different norms, you can get completely different behavior, right? So um, uh, my point with this example is mostly to try to uh, indicate that um, um, it's not even clear how you should formulate such a property, right? I mean, it seems that the formulation should depend on what norm uh, what norm you have on X, right? Because even if we look at the simplest possible example, it's not possible to write down exactly what happened, right? The behavior of linear functions on an arbitrary Banach space can behave in all sorts of different ways, right? There's, there's no one way that such things behave. Um, in fact, you know, that problem itself is one of them, you know, extremely deep problems in probability theory. There were going to be lectures about this by James Lee, but I saw that the program changed. So um, um, you, you need some techniques called generic chaining in order to, to, to study them in complete generality. And it, it, it can get almost arbitrarily complicated, right? And that's linear functions. And now I'm asking you to give an inequality for nonlinear functions, right? So um, how should we formulate such? So, um, what I want to talk about is that um, there is a sensible way to formulate this, uh, this question. Um, and uh, let me give it a name. I just made it up. Okay. So I want to talk about something, let's call it a linear to nonlinear principle. And informally, what does this linear to nonlinear principle say? It says that the behavior of nonlinear functions on a norm space 
should be determined by the behavior of the linear functions. Or let's say controlled by the behavior of the linear functions. So what do I mean by this? Um, you know, in different, if, if, when you have different norms, right, if you have different Banach spaces, linear functions behave in very, very different ways, right? I cannot write down one theorem that explains to you how linear functions behave in the norm space. Well, you can, it's called the, the Bernoulli problem, but this is, you know, it doesn't tell you much in this context, right? So we have to admit the fact that, you know, the behavior of linear functions depends very strongly on, on, on what norm you put on. I'm not going to be able to write down one theorem that explains it, right? But what I want to say is I want to prove a theorem for nonlinear functions that says that, okay, no matter what the, what, how, how the linear functions behave, if you tell me how the linear functions behave, then I can give you an inequality for nonlinear functions that reflects that behavior, right? So the nonlinear functions, no matter how the linear functions behave, I should be able to write down a sort of Poincaré inequality that says that the linear function, the nonlinear functions behave in such a way that it reproduces the correct behavior of the linear functions, okay? So this is a very vague statement. And I want to convince you that the statement makes sense, and um, and that it uh, uh, and that we can prove it, and that it uh, has interesting uh, implications, etc. Okay, so this is where I want to go. Um, so before I try to discover a general statement, you know, how do you state this principle mathematically? Um, let me give an example, right? So of something that would capture this, but only in a special case. Okay, so and and this example I'm giving it. Um, because this is what was originally conjectured. So this, this is historically uh, um, where these type of questions actually come from. Um, so let me make a definition. Okay. So a norm space is said to have type P if the expectation of linear functions, of the norm of a linear function on this space behaves like this. So in the scalar case or in a Hilbert space, we know that this is true of P equals two. And that's exactly what's captured by the regular Poincaré inequality. But in the general Banach space, there's no reason why this should be true of P equals two. For example, we saw that for the L1 norm, this inequality is absolutely not true of P equals two. So let's try to replace the power two by a power P, right? Now, that still doesn't say anything. This is just a property of a certain norm space, right? So you, you could view this type, this is just a definition. The, the norm space has property of type, having type P if you have this type of parallelogram identity, but with a power P in it, right? So for example, um, if we look at the spaces LP or the sequence spaces LP, they have type P, if uh, P is between one and two, and they have type two, if P is between two and infinity. Okay. So now you can see, you know, that, 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 that uh, this is just an example, but you can see that, that different norm spaces have different type, right? It's just a property, you can view this as a property of the norm, right? Now, if we believe in this linear nonlinear principle, then we would guess that, okay, well, I cannot write a general statement because it's not all like all, all norm spaces have the same type. But if I give you a space of type P, then I should have a Poincaré inequality that behaves like this, right? So um, then one has the following statement, right? If X has type P, then the expected norm of F minus the expectation of F squared, no, to the P, is bounded by some i is one to n of the expectation, uh, sorry, yes, no, of the expectation of dif to the power p. Right? So it's just like a Poincaré inequality, but I now replaced p2 by p, right? And for example, if you plug in a linear function to this inequality, you get just the definition of type p back. Right? So different spaces of different type, but no, but whatever property the linear functions have should be reflected in the, in, in the Poincaré inequality. So this is an example, it's not a more general statement, but because this definition of type P is one particular type of inequality you could have for linear functions in the norm space. Um, but this 
example certainly reflects this idea behind this linear to nonlinear principle, right? The Poincaré inequality, which says something about nonlinear functions, should always be such that it reflects the behavior of the linear functions, right? And, and, and this inequality, if it's true, by definition, is stating that the space is, has type P just by plugging in linear functions. Sir Ramon. Yes. Yes, Mark. Uh, you want to mention the range of P for which the type is relevant? Yes, Mark makes a very good point. Um, spaces can only have type P if P is between one and two. Um, every space has type one because that, that inequality has a very good name. This is called the triangle inequality, okay? So if you have P is one, then I've just written here the triangle inequality. So every space is type one. And in that case, we say that the space has trivial type, okay? Because the triangle inequality is not exactly an interesting property. Um, and in that case, the Poincaré inequality is also trivial because it just follows from the triangle inequality. You can just flip the bits one by one. Um, type two is um, type two is Hilbert space. And you cannot have more than type two. Why can't you have more than type two? Because in every linear space, you can just take a one dimensional subspace and it behaves like the scalar case. And the scalar case has type two. So you can never do better than that. Yes, there's another question. Hi, Dan. Yeah, it was just, should the type constant also be in the theorem? Or there is, is a it constant like C, which of course uh, depends on X. Okay, this is the type P constant of the space X. Um, I don't want to get bogged down in these things because I, I just using this as an example of a more general statement that has nothing to do with type. Okay, so um, if you're interested in Banach space theory, then uh, this is where the question came from. It was conjectured by um, by pair n flow, uh, n flow, in uh, in the sixties, seventies, formally in nineteen eighty seven, and we proved it in uh, uh, recently with. Uh, Ramon, I, I think yeah. the question was, the constant should be in the last line of the statement of the theorem. Oh, sorry. Let me put a constant here. And this constant should be uh, connected to the constant here in the, uh, in, in, in the in definition of type, of course. Right? Um, I think we get it. It's the constant definition of type times uh, square root pi over 2 or something, uh, pi over square root. I don't remember exactly, but something. Like that. Thanks. Thanks for all these corrections. Um, but again, I don't want to. Um, um, I don't want to emphasize this notion of type too much because actually, you know, this is just one example, right? This is just one way of expressing how linear functions might behave in a Banach space, right? But there are many other interesting ways of expressing how linear functions behave in a Banach space. You can have much better inequalities than this or different inequalities that look very different, right? So this is just, I mean, if you want to understand what I mean by linear to nonlinear principle, um, uh, this is just one example. You know, here is some way of expressing how linear functions behave, right? And I want to say that if you have such an inequality for linear functions, there should follow a nonlinear inequality for arbitrary nonlinear functions that reflects that behavior of the linear function. Right? Um, but um, uh, so, so, so if you take this definition as how you want to express how linear functions behave, then, this, then it's clear that this should be the right Poincaré inequality. But it's not at all clear why that inequality should be true. Right? And, 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 and that is what we're going to try to discover. Okay, so for us, this is just an example, um, but we don't want just this example. We actually want to say something much more general. We would like to um, say something much more general about this linear to nonlinear principle. We would like to understand why is it that nonlinear functions behave in a way that I only have to know how linear functions behave and I can say something about nonlinear functions. I mean, this seems completely ridiculous, right? I mean, linear functions are very special type of functions. How come I can... Um, make an assumption about how linear functions behave and then say, okay, all nonlinear functions behave, you know, at, at least like that, right? So we have to understand why you have such a linear to nonlinear principle and that's going to be our goal, okay? So um, that's the aim. Um, by the way, the origin of this n-flow problem, uh, you know, it, it actually has uh, various very interesting applications um, and uh, it has to do with embeddings, what you can embed in Banach spaces and whether you can embed metric spaces in Banach spaces and things like this. So uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but it is actually, a, 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 if you're a functional analyst and, or, or you're into metric geometry, this is a very basic uh, type of question that you would want to ask. Um, good. So uh, let's move beyond this. So this is just an example. Um, but what we, we would really like is a more general statement, right? So I would like to understand this more general statement. And again, we're back in the same situation as we were before. Where it's not even clear what to write down. Okay? So what I want to do for the rest of this lecture is talk about um, an easier case, 
which is the case uh, in the Gaussian world, right? So up to now, we've been talking about the discrete cube, but as uh, anyone who has worked with the discrete cube uh, knows that uh, often it's easier to, to have analogous inequalities for Gaussian random variables. And if you understand the Gaussian case first, that's no promise that you understand the discrete cube, but um, it is uh, certainly a nice step towards understanding any problem. And in the Gaussian case, it turns out that this linear to nonlinear principle is understood completely in a very general set. Okay, and I want, and that gives us, uh, once we understand that, that also directs us to what we would like to prove, because, you know, then we have some sort of idea about how to mathematically state this linear to nonlinear principle. Okay, so um, let me, um, is there another question or shall I move on? Uh, Ramon? Yeah. Uh, so I was just curious, it's probably not related to the subject that you're going to pursue, but I was wondering if there is a version of the strong Poincaré inequality for covariance matrices, if one can... Um, Maybe I'll answer it later, I'm not sure, but but let's... let's. Uh, I'm going to give an example that's related to that. I, I'm not sure what strong covariance inequality for Poincaré... Let me get back to this question and you can ask me at the end. Is that okay? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, thanks, Kalina. So, um, uh, let me write down a, a, a theorem in the Gaussian case. Okay, so now imagine, let's forget for a moment about the discrete cube, and let's imagine that we have Gaussian. Instead of IID random signs, we have IID Gaussian random variables. Okay, standard Gaussian random variables. Now, of course, Poincaré inequality makes perfect sense as well. You just get that the variance of a function f is bounded by the expected gradient squared, the norm of the gradient squared. And now we would like to know something about vector value functions. And in this setting, uh, there is a very beautiful theorem um, which was proved by um, Gilles PCA. Let's call this PCA's Gaussian linear to nonlinear principle. Which explains in a completely general setting why this is true that the behavior of linear functions give you inequalities for nonlinear functions. So um, it's in the Gaussian case, but it's it, but it works in any um, uh, norm space. It's completely general in that sense. Um, how is it stated? Let's take G be a standard Gaussian vector. So this this is going to take the this is a standard Gaussian vector of mean zero and unit covariance matrix, um, and uh, this is going to replace my epsilons, my random signs, right? So this is what we're going to plug into our function. But we're also going to take another vector, independent copy G prime. So G prime is just another standard Gaussian vector that's independent of G, okay? Then for every function, now we're Gaussian, so we live on our end, into a norm space, X, okay? What do we have? We have that the expectation of the norm of F minus the expectation of F to the p, let's take any p, okay. expectation of f minus the expectation of f to the power p is bounded by some constant. Actually, the constant is pi over 2 to the p. There you go. Times the expectation of the norm of some i is 1 to n g i prime times the derivative of f in the direction i. And that is PCA's inequality. And so you see, rather than having something like the sum of the squares of the norms of the derivatives on the right-hand side, or the sum of the pth power of the norms of the derivative to the right-hand side, right? These things, you know, these things depend on the Banach space. What is the right, right, right statement? So this p is not the p that comes from having type p. This inequality is true for any p. Right? What I'm saying here is that on the right-hand side, what you should take is you should take a linear combination of the derivative whose coefficients themselves are independent Gaussians, right? So this here is a linear function, right? If we fix G, this is a linear function of this Gaussian vector G prime. Right? So you see whatever the behavior is of linear functions under this norm X, we can just condition on G on the right-hand side, apply the linear inequality to this linear combination of the derivatives and then we get that the same behavior is inherited by the by by the nonlinear functions if, right? So for example, right? If x 
has what is called Gaussian type P. Okay, so that means that the expectation of the norm sum I is one to N epsilon I X I to the P is bounded by sum I is one to N of the norms. Right, so this is exactly the same, sorry, GI. Now I want GI. So it's exactly the same as the definition of type, but rather than, than taking a linear combination with random signs, I take a linear combination with Gaussians. Actually, it turns out that this definition, Gaussian type P is equivalent to the definition of, of, of type P, but I don't want to get into that right now. Um, so this is just a statement about the behavior of linear functions, but in the Gaussian case, well, we can just apply this linear inequality to the right-hand side over here in PCA's inequality. Right? We just condition on G and we just apply this with the linear function being as a function of G prime, right? Then we get that for any nonlinear function, the expectation of F minus the expectation of F to the P is bounded by this cons by some constant. So there's going to be some constant, right? Times sum I is one to N of DF DX I X to the P which is just like the Gaussian form of the n-flow conjecture. So you see this, 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 this notion of type is just one way that you can express how linear functions behave on the Banach space. But this, this inequality of PCA explains for any Banach space, what is the relation between the properties of linear functions and between the properties of nonlinear functions, right? Because it says that the expectation of the norm of a function minus the any nonlinear function minus expectation is bounded by the expectation of a linear function, right? The linear function, so a sum with Gaussian coefficients, a linear function, but where the vectors of the linear function are exactly the derivatives of the nonlinear function. And because G and G prime are independent, I can now apply any statements about linear functions on the right-hand side and get a corresponding inequality for nonlinear functions. And, um, uh, I think this inequality is one, you know, there's a lot of literature on, on functional inequality. This is one that you don't see all that often phrased, uh, particularly in this vector valued case. And it's a very powerful principle and you can apply this to all sorts of other situations. Let me give you another sort of example, maybe to um, uh, satisfy Galina. Um, let's talk about matrices, okay? So uh, just as another example. So let's take, um, let's A1 to AM, B, some D by D, let's say symmetric matrices, just for, for simplicity, right? And now we would like to understand, um, there, there, is a, there is a very classical fact, which is called the non-commutative Kinchin inequality. Let me just write it like this. So non-commutative Kinchin inequality, which says that if I take the expectation of the norm of some linear combination of these matrices with Gaussian coefficients. Let's say, let's take, for example, the operator norm. This is actually a consequence of the non-commutative Kinchin inequality. It, it's, uh, I think it was first noticed by Mark Rudelson. This is bounded by square root log of the dimension times what? The sum of the matrices squared operator norm square root. Okay. So this is a result in random matrix theory. It says that if you have a random matrix with Gaussian entries, not necessarily independent, then here is a result in random matrix theory that tells you how to compute or how to estimate the norm of that random matrix, the largest uh, eigenvalue of that random matrix, okay? Um, and you see, if we view it from our perspective, we think of these D by D matrices as being vectors in our vector space and the coefficients GI are just, so this is just a linear function of matrices. Okay? Now, suppose that we want a nonlinear version of this. What do we do? Now let's consider a function from Rn to d by d symmetric matrices. So this is now a nonlinear function, right? So what does PCA's inequality tell us? Tell us it says that if I take this matrix valued function, I subtract the mean, I take the operator norm. Well, PCA's inequality tells us that this is bounded by pi over two times the expectation of some i is one to n g i prime times the this, the derivative, sorry, I'm not in the vector, in the cube yet, times the derivative of this function, which is of course still a matrix because it's a matrix value function in the ith coordinate, 
But now I can just condition on G and apply the non-commutative Kinchin inequality to this linear combination of matrices. Each matrix is the derivative of the function f with respect to a different value, right? And then I get that this is bounded by square root log D times the expectation of the sum I is one to N of the derivative squared uh, with a square root. And remember that F is a matrix valued function. So DF DXI is also a matrix valued function. So when, when I write square here, this is just the square of the matrix as a matrix, right? Um, so here I have a completely non-trivial inequality. You know, I started with a non-trivial inequality about random matrices of a, of a, you know, which are linear, right? Which are, have Gaussian entries. And I for free turn this into an inequality for a much, much, much more general model of random matrices where I can take um, uh, any matrix valued function of a Gaussian vector, right? That's an extremely general model of random matrices. And I have obtained here for free an inequality about the norms of these nonlinear matrices, right? That depend nonlinearly on Gaussian variables just because I knew something about uh, matrices with Gaussian entries, right? So it's just one more example, right? Of this linear to nonlinear principle, um, but it shows how powerful this, this uh, uh, you know, the statement of PCA is because it says something about any vector space. And you know, why talk about matrices? You know, you can invent any favorite object that you have that lives in the linear space. Um, you know, uh, it's the Simons, fund, it's Simons Institute. You know, uh, every time that uh, uh, if you, uh, uh, my experience is if you talk to people in machine learning, they all perk up magically if you say the word tensor, okay? So, um, so let's take tensor, right? You know, so uh, uh, tensors, well, you can add them up, right? So therefore they live in the linear space. And uh, now you can try to um, write down some norm, for example, some sort of maximum of the tensor or something, whatever you care about. Maybe a hard problem to uh, find norms of tensors, right? To bound the norm of a Gaussian tensor, let's say. But if you have any inequality that bounds the norm of a Gaussian tensor, then boom, stick it into PCA's inequality. Now you for free have an inequality for a very much, much more general model of random tensors, right? So um, I hope you're properly impressed by the power of this inequality, right? And this is a very general principle, which is this linear to nonlinear principle. Okay? And, uh, and we have it in the Gaussian case. And so now we know what we aspire to, right? This is what we aspire to achieve, but we would like to achieve it on the discrete cube. I see so that I somebody can... raised their hand. There's also some, a question in the chat. Uh... Adam Clivens asks if there is a version of Pizier's theorem for functions which are not differentiable everywhere. Uh, well, I mean, so you, it, on the discrete cube, this, uh, this, this is not an issue because every function is differentiable in the discrete cube, okay? Um, in Rn, you know, it's the usual thing that, that um, I mean, you can extend it for free to functions that are differentiable uh, in most places just because by approximation. You know, once you have the, the inequality for smooth functions, you can just run an approximation on both sides and that will give you for, if you have weak derivatives, for example, right? But if you want more generally than that, then I don't know, you would have to give me an analog for the Poincaré inequality and then you can tell me, uh, uh, and I can tell you whether it makes sense or not, okay? But, but uh, it depends on, I don't know exactly how to interpret the question, but, but um, usually the way one proves such inequalities in the continuous case is you first prove it for functions that are very smooth, let's say C infinity with compact support. And then at the end, when you have the inequality, it's clear it only depends on the on, on the weak derivative, you know, on the weak derivatives. You can just run an approximation on both sides. So that's just considered to be a technical point. It's not a. a but if you want to go beyond that, then I don't know the answer. It depends on what you're looking. For. Um, yes, there was another question. Okay, um, I will move forward. By the way, what you know. What happens, you know, what is the maximal distance that you can approximate these things, of course, is uh, um, depends on what you're doing, right? For example, in this situation I wrote here, because there's no power P, probably you can even hand, handle indicator functions, right? Because this looks like a perimeter, what I wrote here. It could be a vector value perimeter, but I haven't checked this. Um, I'm just saying this off the top of my head, okay? So, um, but, but one usually just proves these things by proving it for smooth function first, and then at the end, you can take whatever you need, you know, limit you need on both sides. All right. Um, I have maybe about six more minutes or so. Um, so what I would like to do is I would like to uh, prove PCA's inequality for you. And when you prove PCA's inequality, you will see um, that um, the proof, at least this is the proof that's given in PCA's um, 
in PCA's notes, which uh, he says is a simplification of a more complicated proof he gave before, but I've never seen the more complicated proof um, but, uh, um, that was shown to him by Moret. Um, I don't know this for a fact, I just that's what it's written in the notes. Um, but uh, let me rewrite it. You will see that this proof is extremely Gaussian. So again, let me write the result. So the result says that in any norm space, the expectation of F minus the expectation of F to the P is bounded by some constant. I wrote down what the constant is. It's like pi over two to the P times the expectation of some I is one to N G I prime DF DX I. Let's prove. So um, the idea is going to be some sort of version of the interpolation argument I gave you last time. Right? It's very natural to think about interpolation in order to prove such things. So what we did last time is we thought of the variance as being the expectation of f squared minus the expectation of f squared. Then we found some function that interpolates between them. And uh, then we were able to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now the problem is when you have something like the expected norm of a function f, right, an arbitrary norm, I mean, norms can be very nasty functions, you know, they don't have to be differentiable, uh, you know, there's nothing, you, you know, not, you don't want to try to differentiate a norm because it becomes horrible, right? So um, it doesn't make much sense to try to interpolate this expectation of the norm of f to the power p. But what we can do instead is we can just try to interpolate directly, directly on the function f, okay? And this is what PCA does, um, but PCA doesn't do it with a random construction like I wrote before. What he uses is he uses the rotational invariance of Gauss. So, we all know, presumably, that the Gaussian, the standard Gaussian distribution is rotationally invariant, right? Because its density is e to the minus Euclidean norm of x squared over two. So if I rotate it, nothing changes, right? I still have the norm, the norm is rotationally invariant. So if I take some Gaussian uh, uh, random variables and I rotate it, it's still a standard Gaussian variable. Right? Which means in particular, right, if I take the vector g, g prime, right, if I were to apply some rotation to this vector, it would still be a standard Gaussian vector, right? So it has the same distribution. So let me apply rotation. So cosine, so let me, uh, let me choose the following rotation. I'm just going to rotate by an angle theta between g and g prime. Right? So I have g cosine theta plus uh, g prime sine theta. And here let's put uh, g prime cosine theta minus g uh, uh, sine theta. Right? I've just I've just rotated between g and g prime by an angle theta. And because the Gaussian is rotation invariant, um, these have the same distribution. So the, the top line over here and the bottom line over here are both still standard Gaussian vectors and they're both still independent of each other, right? So they have the same distribution as G and G prime. So let me call this top guy over here. Let me just call it G of theta. And I'm going to call the bottom one G prime of theta. And what you should notice is this is not just suggestive notation. G prime really is DG D theta. Because if I differentiate the cosine, I get a, a minus sine. And if I differentiate the sine, I get a cosine. So what we're going to do is we're just going to interpolate. We take uh, the function f at g prime minus the function f at g. Well, g prime is g at uh, pi over 2. And g is g at 0. So this is equal to the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of dd theta of f of g of theta. Right? I'm taking two independent Gaussians. I'm writing the difference of the function between two independent Gaussians. Well, I can just take a rotation which rotates one of the Gaussians to the other and vice versa and run our usual interpolation argument. But now we're not running the interpolation argument at the level of the expectation of the functions, of the norm of the functions. I'm directly running the interpolation of the functions themselves. Right? So what is this? Well, this is the integral from zero to pi over two of sum i is one to n g prime i of theta times df dx i of f of g, sorry, of g of theta. And there's just the chain rule. 
theta. And let me just write this suggestively as two over pi times pi over two. Um, this is a little bit silly, of course, but I want this integral from zero to pi over two to have mass one. Right, so now I've made the integral a, a random, right? I just put a random point on the on, between zero and pi over two, right? So I've just normalized the integral so it has mass one. Um, and now that we have such an expression, if we want to take the expectation of the norm of these functions, I can just directly apply it here and apply Jensen's inequality, right? So the expectation of the norm of f of g prime minus f of g x to the power p. Well, because I normalize this integral, right, I can just by Jensen's inequality bring the norm inside. So this is less or equal two over pi times the integral from zero to pi over two times the expectation of the norm of pi over two sum i is one to n g i prime of theta times df dx i g of uh, f of g theta to the p. But now you should remember that g i prime of theta, the pair g i prime g doesn't depend on the distribution, doesn't depend on theta by rotational invariance. So actually for every theta, the term inside the integral here is the same. I can just replace, because I took the expectation, I can just replace g i prime theta by g prime and g theta by g, right, by rotational invariance. And then we immediately just get the inequality that I wrote up there. That's the end of the proof. So this is how you do the proof. So this is an interpolation proof with two crucial differences. One difference is that we apply the interpolation directly to the function values. We are not applying it to the quantity we want to bound, the expectation. And the second is that we are not using here a random construction. We're using here something very, very special to the Gaussian distribution, which is rotation invariance. And of course, as you can imagine, the discrete cube is not rotation invariant. You know, if I take two plus or minus ones and I write cosine theta times one of them plus sine theta times another one, obviously this is not going to have the values plus or minus one. And you might think that this is just a technical issue. And as I'll, conv I'll try to convince you at the beginning of the next lecture, actually this is a fundamental point um, that, uh, that, that, that has to be overcome. Okay, and, and, and uh, so I'll resume uh, tomorrow. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Roman. Uh, I think there are a couple of questions in the okay. in the chat. If people want to unmute themselves and ask, hi. Uh, so in the Poincaré inequality case, uh, where the inequality is achieved by linear functions, but yes. here you start from some inequality for linear functions, then derive some inequality for nonlinear functions. I'm just wondering whether the equality here is also achieved by linear functions. Good. So let's check. So, I mean, here we're in the Gaussian case, right? So the inequality here is that the expectation of the norm of f minus the expectation of f to the p is bounded by pi over 2 to the p times the expectation, sum i is 1 to n, g i prime df dx i g p, right? That's the inequality. So what happens if f of x is some i is 1 to n g i x i, sorry, f of g, of course. Then we get the expectation some i is 1 to n uh, g i x i to the p, less or equal pi over 2 to the p um, of the expectation some i is 1 to n, g i prime, and df dx i is just g i. Ooh, uh, df. Okay, I'm, I'm, make, I'm confusing you a little bit, of course. I wrote here df dx i to indicate the uh, ith coordinate, um, right, of the function. But of course, I plugged in a g, so you should really think of that as df dg i. I hope it was clear in the inequality, but now that I wrote x i for some vectors, this becomes a little bit confusing, right? So. What is df dgi? Well, it's just xi. It's the vector xi. So you see gi prime and gi have the same distribution. They're both standard Gaussians, right? So this term and this term are the same. So the only thing that's different is the constant, right? Pi over 2 to the p is not 1. So this inequality doesn't have uh, equality for linear functions with constant 1. 
but up to the value of the constant, this inequality is sharp for linear functions. And this is, of course, by the, that's the whole point of this linear to nonlinear principle, that this inequality always reproduces correctly the behavior of linear functions up to the constant. Now, if you ask about the constant, um, you might conjecture that this constant should be one because that's what you get for linear functions. Um, but that's not true. Actually, the constant pi over two turns out to be sharp. And um, uh, so, so not just the inequality, the PCA's Gaussian inequality is not just the inequality that is uh, sharp, but it's actually the constant is sharp. Um, and um, even this constant is sharp. And this is somewhat related to um, uh, the question that was asked uh, about smoothness. Um, if you have, uh, um, if you apply this with the, in the scalar case with p equals one, then PCA's inequality will give you the following very nice inequality about which I'm going to have more to say. So what is the expectation of the absolute value of f minus? This is like an L1 form of the Poincaré inequality, right? So this is bounded by the expectation of some i is one to n g i prime df dx i of g. But you see, this is now the scalar case, right? So this is just a linear combination of Gaussians, it's just a Gaussian. So this is like the absolute expectation of the absolute value of a Gaussian. It has constant square, it's square root two over pi times the standard deviation. So square root two over pi times pi over two, you get square root pi over two times the expectation of um, the gradient of f. So here is a scalar inequality that follows immediately from PCA's inequality. Um, and in this inequality, you can take limits. And it turns out that if you take limits, it even makes sense for indicator functions. So for indicator functions, this becomes a type of isoparametric inequality. On the left-hand side, you will get the L1, uh, sorry, the variance of some sort. On the right-hand side, you will get the surface area of the set. And it turns out that square root pi over 2 is exactly the sharp constant. You get it if you take a half space in the Gaussian case. Um, so, um, so this inequality does have an equality case where the constant is even sharp, and it's not linear function. So um, I'm going to have a little bit more to say about this inequality and its analogs in the discrete cube in a later lecture. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I hope this answers the question. But certainly for linear functions up to the value of the constant, this is sharp. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ramon, I'm going to repeat uh, two questions from Clément. So his, uh, one of his questions is, was this PZA's original proof? I don't know. It was never published. Ah, OK, I see. Um, he's, he writes, I, if I recall correctly, he writes that it had something to do with Hermite polynomials. He expands in Hermite polynomials and he does some, but I don't know what, uh, what, what that, uh, I don't know what it was. I see. And his uh, second question is, uh, is the case P equals infinity uh, for the norm, not for the type? Uh, is, is that hopeless if you want a general result such as, uh, such as the one that you just showed? Ah, um, okay. Um, this is a good question. Um, you see, in uh, um, in the Gaussian inequality, of course, um, with p equals infinity, um, the result is always true because you see, no matter what function f you choose, you have a linear combination with the gi primes, which are Gaussian. So the L infinity norm of the right hand side, if p is infinity, the right hand side will always be infinity. So that inequality is true, um, but it is not incredibly useful. Um, if you're talking about PCI's inequality. If you want an L infinity norm inequality of the DF DXI's, then in the Gaussian case, you cannot directly get that from PCI's inequality. You will have to, um, you will have to do some approximation. Okay. Now, on the discrete cube, which I haven't told you about yet, but on the discrete cube, the situation is very different because on the discrete cube, you might hope for an L infinity version. Um, and, uh, but that's a different matter. And, and, and um, if you remind me, I can say more about that next time. There, there are still a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, the people should be able to unmute themselves if they want to ask. Hi, I have a question. Um, so the proof of Pizier um, only uses the property of convexity of the norm. So in particular, this should be true for any convex function. So I assume you're going to tell us about an analog for the Boolean case, but would that still be true? Would the, this analog still be true for all convex functions? Yes. 
that was my answer. I, uh, yes, you could take yeah, any yeah. conflicts. But yeah, this, this, I just wrote Thanks. a norm because it was easier, you know, and, uh, but yes, uh, the, the norm property is not important here at all. Yeah. Um, I can try to read. Can you give some idea of, of how the general version of linear to nonlinear principle is proved? But I don't know what you, who, John Fengu, I don't know what you mean by the general version. I also don't know when this question was asked. 228. Um, John Feng, if you still want to ask your question, you will have to clarify what, what the question means. Uh, let me meanwhile go on to the other question. Based on your remarks, you can prove isoperimetry in Gaussian space via PCA's inequality. Um, um, well, it's a good question. Not Certainly not the sharp Gaussian isoperimetric inequality. Now this L1 Poincaré inequality I wrote down um, right, the expectation of the absolute value of f minus the expectation of f is bounded by the expectation of the norm of the gradient of f. Um, uh, this inequality is a type of isoparametric inequality. Yeah, I can write down what it is if you apply it to, right, if you take this inequality in Gauss space, we are now. Okay. If I plug in for f, indicator function of a set A, then the right-hand side becomes, I don't remember what the constant is that you get, but you get some constant times the surface area of the set A or the perimeter of the set A. And on the left-hand side, you get um, the probability of A times one minus the probability of A. Now this isn't, the, this, these two inequalities are actually equivalent. Okay, so you can go from here to here by plugging, so from the top one to the bottom one by plugging an indicator function, you can go the other way by using the co-area formula. Okay, this is a, a let's not talk about that. Um, so, uh, and this second inequality is a type of isoparametric inequality, right? It has, a, it says that the probability of a set, the volume of a set is bounded by the surface area. Right? So this is a type of isoparametric inequality and it has a name, this is called Cheeger's inequality on Gauss space. So this is an analog of Cheeger's inequality, which, which if you've ever seen Cheeger's inequality for graphs or undifferentiable manifolds, you'll know what Cheeger's inequality is. This inequality over here is an analog of Cheeger's inequality, but for Gaussian measure. Um, but Cheeger's inequality is not a sharp inequality, right? For the Gaussian measure, we have the exact sharp Gaussian isoparametric inequality, which says that um, the surface area of, uh, among all sets of the same probability, the surface area is minimized by half spaces. Um, and uh, I have absolutely, do not believe that such an inequality can be proved using PCA's inequality, um, even up to a constant. Um, though up to a constant may be in a very roundabout way, but certainly not directly. So I hope that answers the question. But this is a type of isoparametric inequality, it's just not the Gaussian isoparametric inequality. For the earlier question, uh, uh, John Fung sent uh, a clarification. I, I think he, he was asking, can you uh, give some idea of the general version of, uh, can you give an idea of the proof of the, the MFLOW type P inequality? But I, I think that's coming in your later lectures. Yeah, in the next lecture, I'm going to, uh, you mean on the discrete cube? Because the PCI's inequality works in the Gaussian case, right? This is, an, uh, we haven't done anything yet on the discrete cube, right? And in the Gaussian case, um, it's immediate, right? This is this example, the second example over here on this page, you see, if you assume that the Banach space is Gaussian type P, which is just like type P, but you replace the random signs by Gaussian, then you get this Gaussian form of the inflow problem. And what do you do? You just take the left-hand side of PCA's inequality, just fix G, condition on G, and apply the definition of Gaussian type P to the, to the, to the right-hand side of PCA's inequality. And it immediately gives you this inflow type P statement. Right. I think this for, question for, for was asked. Random if, yeah, I think this question was asked before you presented the proof, so it's about the discrete case. I see. So the discrete case we're going to talk about next time. I have so far not told you what is the what how you even state the the, the linear to nonlinear principle in the discrete case. So we're going to talk about this in detail in the next lecture.
Okay, uh, if there are no further questions, uh, let's thank Ramon again, and we'll reconvene right. tomorrow at nine. Uh, tomorrow we'll hear from Irit, Ramon, and Jelani. Okay, thanks everyone. See you tomorrow. Great.